So I'd like to welcome everyone to Science for Food Security, making a global, professional and personal difference. My name is Serena Locke and I've been a rural journalist for 30 years almost with the ABC and I've, I've covered agriculture here and overseas. I've been to Indonesia, and West Timor, Timor-Leste, uh, reporting on food security and Australia's agricultural aid programs. And I'm now National Regional Planning Editor with the ABC. So welcome to you all. First of all, we'll have an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land. So with this forum today, we want high school students, university students, and you in the general public to know about the impacts of science in global food and nutrition security, and the broad range of study and career and volunteering opportunities to help you get on your way. I've had my own chance to see Australia's agricultural aid up close. Uh, when I went to Timor-Leste in 2016 with the ABC and also the Crawford Fund, to report on one of Australia's longest running agricultural aid projects. So Timor had suffered under hundreds of years of occupation, but in 1999, the people voted for independence. And Timor-Leste was young, but a very hungry nation. And Australian agronomists were some of the first on the scene to start restoring farm productivity. They had the task to take five essential food crops and improve the seed varieties so that they would be more productive. Like peanuts, you think of your staples, peanuts, beans, cassava, corn and sweet potato. Now after 20 years, Australian agricultural assistance, uh, there are more productive food crops like this corn that you can see drying in the sun. And the corn is so abundant that the farming, the farming families need new storage techniques or it all gets eaten by weevils and rats. You can see the contrast with the old varieties and just how unproductive uh, they were and they caused famine. So modern agricultural aid also taps into the knowledge and the wisdom of women and their important role in the family and the village. And women control the spending on children's education. They cook the nutritious food and they often do the farming work, the hard work in the fields. It's women like Francesca. And she said with the help of the Australian Seeds of Life Project, the family had stopped going hungry and with the income from the sale of surplus corn, she had sent her children to university and she said the family had been able to cement the floor of the house, buy a motorbike and pay for weddings and funerals. So Australia's agricultural extension and research has built capacity for Francesca and her family. And you'll hear that expression a lot in aid work, capacity building, listen out for it. So let's meet our inspiring speakers today. Sam Coggins was a graduate officer at the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, and he's now working on digital tools for farmers in developing countries. It's a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's project, and he's doing a PhD to help alleviate climate risks for farmers abroad and also at home. Anika Molesworth is a passionate advocate for sustainable farming, environmental conservation and action on climate change. She got her taste of that during the millennium drought up in Broken Hill and it's where she's beaming in from today. So thanks Anika. And most recently she signed a book deal to write about climate change and food security issues. It's all very current. Matt Chantness is doing a PhD around soil and water for smart irrigation technology in the rice systems. You saw him in the video there. Matt works and worked as a volunteer agronomist with the Australian Volunteers Program for 12 months in Lao PDR as part of a long running program by Crawford Fund. I think going more than 10 years. So that's something that you can tap into. So we have some pre-submitted questions from our audience, but you're all invited to submit any other questions you have during the presentations. It's in the comments section and we can include them in the Q&A after all the three speakers have presented, but get the questions down there as soon as you think of them. 
Uh, you're also invited to introduce yourself for the school. Tell us where you're from. Um, and we have some viewers from overseas, so it'd be great to see the wide diversity of places you're watching on from online. And uh, you'll see a poll on your screen to complete, so we know who you are, your audience. Um, and so are you from a school, from a university? Are you beaming in from overseas or are you just generally interested? So respond to that and keep an eye on the comments for the results. And now, first, I'll hand over to Sam. Thanks, Serena. Good everybody. My name's Sam. I'm 24 years old and I love agriculture for international development. Agriculture for international development is what Serena was just talking about. It's really simply, it's trying to make the world better through agriculture. So today I want to explain why I love it so much and why I think it is a great career choice for young Australians and young people all around the world. To do this, I want to tell you about this place. It's a student dormitory that I lived with three Sri Lankan roommates during a semester abroad in Sri Lanka. Um, on one of the weekends while I was there, I went on a bushwalk with this German guy. Um, and this German guy told me a story about where he went mountain climbing in China and he got a chairlift to the top of this Chinese mountain. The people that he shared the chairlift with took it in turns to stand on top of the mountain and pump their fist in the air and scream for the camera. And I found this story really funny because these guys were pretending to the world and to Instagram and to themselves that they'd conquered this mountain when really somebody had just built a chairlift for them. And then I went back to my, my Sri Lankan dormitory with my three Sri Lankan friends and they were there studying for this English exam. And I do this every weekend, studying for an English exam so they can have a chance at applying for a scholarship to go to university in Australia. Thinking more about this, I realized that my whole life has been a really big chairlift. I was born in one of the richest countries in the world, an English speaking country. I had a loving family, um, excellent nutrition, excellent education opportunities. These things are pretty normal for a lot of Australians, but they're far from normal for most of the world's population. Um, my Sri Lankan friends, they were busting your gut every weekend to just have a chance at some of the opportunities that I was given by default. I find this unfairness really confronting, not just at an individual level, but then also, as you see on the screen here, at a big picture level. Today, 821 million people don't have enough food to eat, let alone nutritious food. And here I am sitting in this nice house with as much food as I want, with expensive headphones. The unfairness is really striking. Um, and yeah, and so, my, the, so it brings up this question in my mind that I'm always asking myself and I hope we can reflect on it together today. And the question is, if we, the privileged young people of Australia, if we don't take meaningful actions against poverty, hunger, climate change, are we in part responsible for the human suffering and the unfairness that these awful problems create? Um, and if your answer to that is a maybe or a yes, then the next question becomes, well, what are we supposed to do as young Australians? What, what are some meaningful actions that we can take to contribute to solutions to these very real problems? And I was at a big loss for this for a long time until I found agriculture for international development. I learned that most poor people in the world are farming families. Most hungry people in the world are farming families. And farming families produce almost all of the food that you and I eat every day. So in view of this, in, in Bill Gates' words, it's been proven that of all interventions to reduce poverty, improving agriculture productivity is the best. And that is why I love agriculture for international development. It is a practical and effective way for young Australians like you and me to contribute to real solutions for poverty, hunger, climate change, to work with people, to build chairlifts, with people that may not have one. So what is a job in agriculture for international development? Well, for me, I work with rice farmers and rice scientists on digital tools to improve farming practices in Myanmar. Myanmar is a country of 50 million people between India and Thailand. This is one of the farmers that we get to work with. And we're developing videos and infographics on improved farming practices so farmers can share the knowledge of scientists and the knowledge of themselves through their farming experience to help farmers improve their rice yields, improve their livelihoods and reduce their environmental impacts. 
on an average day, I might have a call in the morning with a rice scientist on the content of our infographics and video. It might go to the next slide for that. So yeah, we might have a call in the morning with rice scientists and then in the afternoon might have a Facebook messenger call with one of the farmers we're working with and he might say, oh, this doesn't work for X, Y, and Z. We need to make these changes to the, to the video. And then in the evening, might have a call with one of our business mentors on how we can provide this service with farmers more sustainably and more scalably. So every day I get to learn something different. Every day I get to contribute to stuff that I really believe in. And every day I get to do something different, whether it's software development, business model design, learn about soil science, practicalities of rice farming, Burmese language, um, different cultures of Myanmar. Every day I get to do something really different. And that's just the variety within my job. There is a massive variety across jobs in agriculture for international development. Some of my friends that work in this field studied anthropology, mechatronic engineering, drone technology, economics. The list never ends. It's not about making agriculture your passion or your skill set. It's making your skill set or your passion fit agriculture. The only other thing you need to work in agriculture for international development, you need that concrete skill set, but you also need some international experience on the ground with farmers. And I always found it really annoying when people told me this because how are you supposed to get international experience if you don't have international experience? Um, and so luckily there are a lot of opportunities for young Australians like you and me to get that international experience on the ground with farmers. These include the New Colombo Plan Scholarship, um, Australian Volunteers for International Development, um, the Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research Graduate Program, Engineers Without Borders Australia, um, Researchers in Agriculture for International Development. They have a great website. You can become a member for free and join their Facebook group to get up to date with all the latest opportunities. And obviously, of course, the Crawford Fund, they have conference scholarships and student awards for young Australians to be able to go over to, to developing countries and, and learn with farmers. So I must emphasise on this slide that these are the structured formal opportunities, but there are also many informal, unstructured opportunities, many more informal opportunities, internships, research opportunities, random jobs that come up. And the only way to access those informal opportunities is to be connected with people that know about them. And so this means talking with lecturers after class, um, following the RAID Facebook group, um, emailing people, going to conferences and talking with people, I know this can be squeamish, especially for introverted people like me. I feel really squeamish about this networking. Um, but the good news is that the more you do it, the easier it gets. Most people in agriculture for international development are really, really keen to support young people that want to get into it, um, myself included. And then the last thing is that the worst thing you can happen if you send somebody an email out of the blue or want to talk to them after class, the worst thing that can happen is they don't reply to your email or they don't have time to talk with you. And if that's the worst thing that can happen, then it's well worth having a crack. So to sum it all up, um, I love agriculture for international development because the world is a very unfair place and agriculture is a practical way um, for us to build share lists with people that may not have one. And then the last point is that there is a massive variety of careers. You don't have to study agriculture to get into agriculture for international development. You can develop whatever skill set you want, develop international experience, and then you can work in agriculture for international development together. So I'll now keenly hand over to Anika. Thank you so much, Sam, for your excellent presentation and explanation of why international agriculture is just so important. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in this webinar on science for food security. My name is Anika Molesworth, and it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'll just get my slides up here. So the, my first image of my slide, so a couple of years ago, I realized I was in a fairly soul draining job in a windowless office. And the impact that I wanted to make on the world was never going to happen if I didn't get off my chair. I was studying a master's in sustainable agriculture. And although I was loving what I was learning in Australia, I wanted to expand my knowledge into other areas of the world. 
I knew that there were big global challenges and issues on food security, but I was feeling relatively disconnected from them. So I emailed everyone I knew at my university with a question. Do you know of a faraway place with a farming project that I can get involved with? After about my 20th email, I finally got a response. And I was told that there was a desk in the Provincial Agricultural and Forestry Office in Laos in Southeast Asia, if I wanted to go there. Fast forwarding a couple of months and I was in Laos, waking up to the sounds of monks chanting, walking down the street each morning. This is a picture of the mighty Mekong River and a fisherman pulling in his line. This was the sight I saw each evening. It is a place that is very difficult not to fall in love with. Now, I love science. I love being around scientists who have such inquisitive minds, who are always questioning the world and trying to work out how do we do things better. And as you will hear in this presentation, um, you know, I've met some amazing people along my journey. This quote I particularly love, science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and it is the torch that illuminates the world. So the original project I was working on in Laos was an integrated crop livestock systems. And it was exploring how do we recycle and revalue agricultural byproducts. Crops are harvested, their residues are fed to livestock, the livestock enjoy the feed and their manure creates an organic fertilizer, which is then reapplied to next season's crop. From this study, I created my own project with the question that stemmed from my interest in climate change. I conducted a thesis on farmer perceptions of climate change and how they were adapting. And it was a fascinating social study in which I traveled around the region, interviewing farmers with a translator. And I learned how higher temperatures and changes in rainfall were impacting food and what could be produced and where it could be produced. I learned how farmers were making changes on their farms where they could, but I also learned about how many farmers have such limited adaptive capacity in these parts of the world due to their small land sizes, their poor financial resources, limited labor availability, scarce water resources, relatively infertile soil. So the study made it apparent to me how important planetary health is to farm productivity and ultimately food security. Once my master's thesis was finished, I returned back to Australia and was quickly approached by another university who offered me a PhD. Now this PhD had a Southeast Asian focus and before I knew it, I was off to Cambodia. And for the next couple of months, I worked with the Cambodian Agricultural Research and Development Institute, working with the soil and water department. And I spent my days out at the research center collecting rice straw, carrying bags of cattle manure, planting maize, counting maize seedlings, harvesting maize, drying and weighing maize. There was a lot of work to do with maize, which I found really interesting. And we were trying to determine how organic residues may improve soil conditions. In Southeast Asia, they have two very distinct seasons, a wet season and a dry season. And in the wet season, the soil is kind of similar to thick soup. And in the dry season, it cements like concrete, so much so that it is actually difficult to drive a nail through. So even though my research was conducted in the dry season, I will actually never forget um, my last seasons of trials when just before harvest, the heavens opened and the rain came down and it rained and it rained. And we actually ended up harvesting our co cobs of maize, wading through knee deep mud, fish swimming amongst our legs. So even with the best plans, we are ultimately as farmers at the mercy of the weather. This is a photo of me in Cambodia because international agricultural research is not all about work. My colleagues seem to really have had their priorities sorted out pretty well. Family, friends, food, fun are all things that are most important and somewhere much further down the rung is, is work. So I spent a lot of my time in Southeast Asia eating, dancing, doing karaoke. 
and they have such a beautiful um, outlook and appreciation of life. And I think that's why I loved my experience in Southeast Asia just so much. So if you are considering getting involved in science, agriculture, food systems, environment or climate studies, then, you know, I really do congratulate you because this is such a meaningful area to be working in. Those who are contributing to agricultural science and food security are making such a meaningful contribution to feeding people, to human well-being, protecting habitats and wildlife, and sustaining the vibrancy of rural communities. It is such an exciting and important area. So if you are considering getting involved, reach out, um, you know, email people, you won't regret it. I want to thank you for your attention this morning and for the organisations who have made this event possible, particularly the Crawford Fund, first and foremost, but also RAID and ACL. If you have any questions, please do send them through. But now I would like to hand over to the next speaker, Matt. Thanks, Maker. Wow, eh? that's a uh, hard line up to follow. Um, some great stories there from Sam and Anika. And um, Anika's resonated um, so much with me. Uh, so I just returned from um, 12 months in, in Laos, down in Savannakhet, which is where Anika was based. And um, that table, she said she got, well, I think they sold that off and I had to buy a new one in that dusty little office. Um, so yeah, some of those photos, those Mekong sunsets, I, um, I really miss them in the, um, I'm coming from Griffith in New South Wales, where it's certainly not that warm and nice here at the moment. So yeah, my, bit of my story, I finished uni and, um, I'd gone to this thing a few months beforehand, um, the, the Crawford conference, which, which Sam talked about and I'll probably their link in the comments section there and um, met all these 50 odd other young people my age that were doing some awesome stuff in the international ag development space and I thought oh wow that's um, that's something I'd want to get into but I don't know if if sort of I can do that if I can cut it and, and how what do, what do I do where, where do I go um, so anyway a um, position came up with the um, Australian Volunteers Program as a volunteer agronomist in Laos. And I thought, oh yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty interesting, pretty meaningful, um, and, and I could really, really have a crack um, at it and, and hopefully provide some, some value to farmers there. And anyway, I applied and, um, and, and got through the process. Um, so a bit of a short history of the um, Young Volunteers Program or background about it. There's there's some training in Melbourne they do. Um, Crawford Fund's great in providing a, a mentor um, to assist you while, while you're overseas in, in country. Um, and the Australian Volunteers Program also help with coordination of everything. You put with a partner program, um, with, with a partner organisation, sorry, and, and provide, um, provide living costs for you. Um, so you can get by. So anyway, I, um, I, I got the position pretty excited and then I, then I Googled where Lau was. Um, I knew it was in Southeast Asia somewhere. Um, so yeah, went over there to, to learn something new and to, to open my eyes was the, um, was the goal. So it, I went from Australian farming, big, big tractors, big machinery, uh, to, to very, a country that, that's only just coming into, into mechanisation. So little hand tractors um, and little seeding rigs. So very much labour intensive farming, very different to, to what I was used to. So went over there and, um, and my project was working on, on weeds in rice and um, such a big issue there in a country where, where herbicides aren't used and and women spend day after day after day weeding their rice to so, so they have yield basically so they can feed their family so this is a huge huge issue that, that we can't fathom here on the impact that, that it has on their on their rice production there so 
came up with a little invention there, which you can see in the screen, a little, a little implement that goes on the um, end of a whipper snipper and a cover over it to, um, to pulverize the weeds in rice and sort of give the rice a, a second chance and, and hopefully farmers can get a bit of yield off it. So really, really saving time for, um, for particularly for women that do the weeding. And um, I, um, there, there was one farmer I recall, he, he said, why do I want the machine? That means I have to do the work. I can't sit in the hammock and watch my wife do it. I thought, well, well, that, that, that was the whole idea of it. That was get out there and get it done quickly with the machine rather than sending your wife out there all day, day after day. So yeah, what, did that and, and taught a lot of English, building capacity of, of local government staff, um, allowing them to, to potentially get a, get a higher education level, whether it be in, in, in Laos, in, in Thailand, or potentially a a master's degree in Australia or something like that and, and offer more opportunities for jobs um, and, and more projects. There was one, one day that really, really stands out for me and that was, um, that was a day where we wanted to take this machine out to, um, out to farmers who, who really needed it. So we, we, we went way out um, to, the, to the east towards the Vietnamese border, um, found a, a very, a very poor district within the province and then, and then within that a, a, a very poor um, village. So this was a, the photo on the, the top right is of, in the, um, in sort of the district capital, I suppose. And then, so we stayed the night there. It was quite a trek to get out there. Roads were pretty rough and we're in this place at um, Anika. I can resonate with not being able to, um, Hit a, hit a nail into the ground, it's, it can be that hard. Um, but then at the same time, it can go 10 feet underwater in a few months. Um, so anyway, we stayed out there in a hotel and, um, and then we got up in the morning, went to the market and, and this, is, this, is, this is an everyday market. This is people selling what produce they have to, to provide, get some money to, to provide for their families. So some of these storeholders probably have they're probably average, but there were certainly some that had a lot less. Might have been selling six bananas and, and three crickets that they'd managed to, to scavenge um, the day before. So anyway, we stocked up on food and, and drove, bounced around in the back of the Hilux for a couple of more hours to, to get to the village, to the farmers where we wanted to go. And um, it was just a little hot. There wasn't it wasn't much at all to, you, you couldn't call it a, a house. And, um, and we, brought, we brought food. So we were probably three or four months off, off rice harvest. So we brought, brought lunch um, for the family and they were just so stoked. We, you can see that that big bowl of sticky rice, that big basket there, that they'd been rationing their, their rice. So we're down to two meals a day instead of three. And within that, they were rationing it. And you could, you could tell that but on the, looking at the children. And they had a few chickens, but they hadn't been laying many eggs. So they were pretty stoked with the eggs that we bought and the, and the dried beef. Well, they hadn't had any of that for, for a couple of years. So said they hadn't had enough money um, to be able to buy that. So we had a feed and, and, a, um, and a drink and, and sat around for a while. Then we went out to the, to the field and had a chat to the farmer and what he was doing and that, but which, which was good. He was on the, on the right track, but I left that and returned to the village capital. And I suppose on that, oh, sorry, to the provincial capital. And I suppose that was my a day that really resonated, I suppose, with Sam's story of just how lucky we are to, to have been born on that, um, at the top of the chairlift. Um, so that's certainly one day that'll, that, that'll stick with me. Um, so yeah, my time over in Laos, it, um, it was challenging, but I learned so much, learned so much about smallholder farming and, and how challenging it is. Um, so I'd give an idea, all these in this top picture, uh, one sort of three or four of those little bays might be, might be one family's farm. So a lot smaller than what what we're used to and hence these farmers don't have a lot of money and um, 
and, and, and yet they're the ones doing the, doing the big days to feed for everyone else. So really engaged myself in the community, learnt, learnt a new language, which isn't overly useful um, in Griffith, being able to speak Lao, um, but I still am in contact every day to the colleagues I worked with, see on Facebook what the farmers are up to, um, and still able to sort of read and write and speak um, to them, which is really good. Like particularly, I want to go back there. Obviously we can't because of coronavirus and being able to stay in touch is, um, is, is really good. So I left Lao and came back here, obviously coronavirus stuck back here, but um, in Australia, but I came back really wanting to, to, to go back there and make an impact. Um, but to do that, I realised I needed postgraduate studies um, and it happened to be while I was over there, I attacked onto an ACR um, project for a couple of days, went down there, met some researchers and, um, and one of them now has become my PhD supervisor. I really liked the work they were doing there, but then back in Australia and how I could learn a lot of skills here in Australian rice farming and be able to take them back to um, Southeast Asia in years, years to come. So really keen to get back there and um, work, yeah, work towards helping to, to feed the, the, the planet and, and really take some of the labor out of, out of farming in that region. So as Sam sort of covered off on the, um, on how to get in, get in touch, but um, I suppose to reiterate, if you're a bit shy, if you're a bit nervous, um, you're not sure well, what uni lecturer is there to, to talk to um, at my uni or who do I talk to at school, the, the RAID network on Facebook's pretty good group that you could just pop in your interests or whatever. And, and that's, that's sort of where everyone will see that and can, can Will, could get in touch with you um, from there if you don't know directly, but certainly if you're interested, speak up and um, and get involved. So we'll hand back to Serena for um, some questions if they're, they're still coming in. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Anika and Sam. Really, really interesting talks. And so, you know, all along the lines of wanting to do good and really gaining yourself enormous um, kind of knowledge and yeah uh, a sense of empathy with the people you're working with so um, maybe just to kick it off while you're thinking of your questions and you're getting your questions down audience um, and putting it into the Facebook section so that we can ask our panel uh, maybe what's your funniest experience Anika my funniest experience okay I went out to a field in Laos to a rice field with my Lao colleagues and we were walking amongst the plants and I noticed, you know, the leaves had been nibbled, like there were holes throughout the leaves. And I turned to my colleague and I said, oh, what's causing this? And he said, snakes, there's a lot of snakes here. And they lay eggs amongst the, the, the rice plants. And when the eggs hatch, the little snakes come out and they eat the rice. And so throughout the day, I'm like, you know, walking really like nervously amongst these these plants and like the story is getting worse in my head as the day goes on like oh my god I'm gonna walk onto a pile of snakes anyway thankfully I didn't get attacked or bitten by snakes and it wasn't until uh, probably the following week when we were back in the office and my colleague was flipping through one of his translation books and he goes oh it wasn't snakes it was snails snails I meant to say snails are eating the rice plants <laughs> So I had a good laugh about that and um, continued to go back into the rice paddies. <laughs> um, Sam, do you have a funny story before we get to one of the questions here? Or uh, should we ask the question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, come funny on. experience first. Not as good as the Nika's one. Yeah, it was um, in Sri Lanka. They have a lot of spicy food and they really love singing, which is an awful combination for me because I'm awful at singing and awful at eating spicy food. Um, and we had a uni field trip through some vegetable growers on the bus. They were all singing their Sri Lankan songs, getting really into it. And I was sort of just sitting there trying not to bring attention to myself. But then eventually they asked for me to sing a song from Australia. Um, 
and I really didn't couldn't think of anything. And then the first thing that popped in was um, give me a home among the gum trees. Um, and yeah, they were just killing themselves laughing within the first three lines. And then um, yeah, after they finally said like, okay, that's enough, Sam. And then got me to sit down. Um, Talent quest is over. So Sam, we have a question from Rhett Mottram. And he, he asks, what's your opinion on teaching farmers computer programming skills for the future of agriculture? I suppose we think of agriculture as dirt and water, but yeah, computer programming. Good question. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, I guess the farmers that we work with in Myanmar, the first, they've never interacted with a digital tool before they started, got their very own basic phone and then a smartphone. And so um, they're getting up to speed with using Facebook. A lot of them, that's the only thing they use their phone for. Um, and so I think uh, start with where they're at. And like a lot of them, they really love using Facebook to share their knowledge. They share photos of their rice plant of snails or snakes attacking it. And um, they, they really leverage those platforms to share knowledge with each other. Um, but yeah, I think eventually down the track, then, yeah, then farmers will be developing their own apps. And um, well, there's one farmer already in, in India. He started making his own YouTube videos about farming in 2017, um, his, um, the YouTube channel is called Farming Leader. There's YouTube videos all about extracting semen from a bull for artificial insemination, what's the best machines to use. And now he has over um, 3 million subscribers on his YouTube channel and over a quarter of a billion views of his videos. It's amazing. He doesn't do farming anymore. He's a full-time farming YouTuber. Um, so yeah, that, the possibilities are really opening up really quickly um, with the penetration of digital tools and and mobile network access, for sure. It's a fascinating question because when I was in East Timor, a lot of the ways they communicated was through plays and also local radio. But because everybody now has a mobile phone in their hand, they were then switching over to broader radio and as you say, you know, videos. And how many more people can you reach if you're, if you're doing a community play, then that's a handful of people. But that's a world of difference. I suppose yep. adding on that, um, Sam, as far as um, careers in, um, in this space as well, um, farmers can't do it all and people with ag degrees can't do it all. So um, certainly those people with um, computer programming skills, um, we, we'd love to have you on board. Um, as Serena said, farming is a lot more than, than soils, water and, and crops. Um, and some of us, we, 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 don't, we can't cover everything. So um, the bigger the team, um, the better it is. Um, but one, one funny story I've got, um, I suppose similar to Anika's, I um, was asking a farmer, he was having some troubles with his rice and I, oh, I asked my colleague to, in English for him to translate and he asked a question, got a, got a five minute answer back and I, and I got a no, was the, was the answer. So I thought, all right, I'm not going to get a lot here. So I, I used my Lao and I, I battled through about it. 10 or 15 minute conversation in loud directly with the farmer. And I thought I'd done pretty well and I understood what, what, what he meant. I built a story in my head and I think I, I worked out everything. And then I went to get in the car to leave and he said, goodbye Matt, have a good day in perfect English. <laughs> I turned around and oh, do you speak English? And he said, yes, I speak fluent English. I learned in the capital. <laughs> so, I should have been having my conversation in English the whole time. So I suppose that that taught me to, um, to, to never assume. So thank you for that. And Scott Graham is, um, has posed the question for all our speakers and it is, it's another really good question. So perhaps Anika first, what do you wish you were told about at school, which you were not aware of that's really helped you find or, or take the path you're now on? I guess I just didn't realise how many opportunities there were in agriculture and how important this work actually was. In my school, um, so I did my schooling in Melbourne, ag farming, it just wasn't a subject that was brought up. Um, food security really didn't learn about it, which is super disappointing because since leaving school and, you know, having my eyes open to these topics and these big global um, issues, which are so important, I think, my gosh, like this absolutely needs to be in the school curriculums everywhere. And whether you're, you know, you're interested in geography, social sciences, um, information technology, 
you can apply that to agriculture and to food security. So um, yeah, it's just knowing that there are so many diverse rewarding careers in agriculture. Sam? Uh, yeah, the only thing to chip in with that would be, um, I, I grew up in, in the city and went to school in the city like in Ica, and before going into agriculture, I thought that then agriculture couldn't be for me because I'm not from a farm, I'm not from a farming background, people won't accept me in agriculture and I was always sort of worried about that but then I now know now there's nothing to worry about. If you're keen to learn, nobody cares if you grew up as a seventh generation farmer or if you grew up in the middle of Sydney. Um, yeah, agriculture welcomes everybody if you're, if you're keen to learn. So Deirdre Lamerl has asked, how can we better prepare and support you for an international assignment? And I think that goes to that question around, do you feel supported as well? Is it, is it a safe environment? Is, what can prepare you for international work? I suppose fine. I was, I was lucky. Um, Deirdre was actually my mentor when I was overseas. And that was fantastic. Having someone who could bounce ideas around and, and help you out in those tough times and understand um, what was going on. And I, I linked in with a, um, with, with someone who's now a, a, a really good um, mentor of mine, um, continued on, um, who he did his PhD in Laos many years ago. And, um, and I, he was happy for me to send a WhatsApp or give a call anytime to, um, to discuss the challenges I was having and potential ways to go about or, or the cultural nuances. So really linking in with people um, who have already been in the country and, and know um, the ins and outs of everything, that's, that's absolutely vital, I reckon. Um, I, I Maybe a I, simple thing, Matt. Um, do you get paid as a volunteer? I mean, you were there as, you know. Yeah, definitely. So the, um, with the Australian Volunteers Program, um, getting, getting the... Um, getting the monthly allowance, um, living allowance um, was really good. And that network of, of other volunteers across the country or in neighbouring countries as well. Um, to talk to, to, to discuss, I suppose, the, the more general um, cultural nuances um, and, and, and the living overseas, um, but then within agriculture, certainly that, um, that raid network, because um, the same things, that Sam's talking about that he's faced in Myanmar are uh, pretty much exactly the same as the challenges and the, and the stuff that, that you face in Laos and Cambodia as well. Anika for, and, and everyone, perhaps you first though, a question from Gillian Lyle who presented yesterday, so it's lovely to, that you've joined us again. What are your thoughts on the benefits of long-term volunteers um, on the ground rather than short-term projects? Because obviously there are both. Absolutely huge benefits with long term projects uh, for someone like me who really struggles to learn a new language. If I had longer than three months in Laos, that would have really benefited me. So I could have communicated properly with the farmers I was working with um, and with my colleagues. Also, in many of these places, it actually does take quite a while to build, you know, a good trusting rapport, friendship with your colleagues, with the farmers. So you don't just rush in and start interrogating them about, you know, um, their livelihoods and their lives. You have to actually build trust. You have to build that relationship and that takes time. There's also, you know, a lot to understand about the culture, the, the people in these places. And I think all of us as young um, scientists who go overseas, we're incredibly inquisitive. We're curious. We want to understand the culture, the people, the places, what's shaping them. How do you grow food in very challenging environments? And you don't learn that in one, two months or one season. That comes over probably many years. So absolutely huge value in long-term projects. Sam, long-term projects versus short-term and, and the benefits of both. I think there are benefits of short-term as well, aren't there, Sam? Yeah, I think, I think well, I, the way I try and look at it is individually we can do very little, but together we can do a lot of stuff. And so whether you're contributing to a long-term program over a short-term or a long-term, you're contributing to a collective effort. And that's, that's really the crucial thing from my point of view. 
So Red Mottram has asked another question and, and um, it's a follow up to Sam's. Um, Australian and other developed countries use satellites for contactless farming. Would we be able to assist these farmers using the technologies? Sorry, was that for me or for some? That was again? for Sam at this point, but um, okay. yeah, I'm sure Matt can answer that question as well. Yeah, there's um, yeah, some really exciting developments with that that is already in use. So one example is using satellites to measure whether farmers have lost yields. And when you can do that by satellites rather than driving out on a motorbike to somebody's farm, then you can offer them insurance for their farm. So if they have a drought or a flood that Matt was talking about and their crop is devastated, um, they can buy it, they can be insured for that and it becomes really efficient using satellites. Or you can also use satellites to work out where in the field needs fertiliser or um, where is a pest and disease coming before you can spot it with your own eyes. So um, at the moment, there are a lot of challenges with it and it's not used at scale in a lot of developing countries, but um, yeah, the technology is building all the time, better and better satellites, better and better software. So yeah, the possibilities for that stuff is, is really exciting. Matt, you worked a bit with technology and, and continuing to develop apps and things. So is that something that, yeah, the contactless farming and the benefit yeah. there and over, here and overseas? Yeah, I think it's great that the legalities around it and who owns the, the, the images and, and, and picture and all that privacy is certainly an issue we have enough in Australia. And I suppose I'm probably not qualified enough to comment on it, but certainly um, I suppose reiterating, reiterating where, what Sam's at, taking, working out where, where farmers are at the moment and where they want to be and where they view things. Um, because there's a big, big thing in, in um, when you work overseas, you sort of think that maybe yield, like in Australia, we have the rhetoric that, that yield is king. It's all about high yielding, but in other places, it's not necessarily. It's about, as, as Anika said, it's lifestyle. It's about how much can, can I spend less time on the farm and still get the same yield. Um, so it's about learning what, what farmers actually want, what drives them in the morning and, um, and, and then what to, to lead to, is it profitability that they want? Is it lifestyle? Is it yield? Um, so I think I think that's key. Um, certainly, there's a lot we can do with, um, with with all this sort of technology. And there's some really cool stuff of, um, in China with, with swarms of drones going out together, ten or twenty, just leave a trailer and buzz off, do their thing, come back, recharge, another one goes out, sort of stuff. But um, bring that back into um, all the, all the software engineers, um, computer scientists and, and programmers, we, we need them in agriculture to really, to really set that off. Sometimes it's the simplest inventions that are the most useful. When in East Timor, they had an abundance of corn because the programs had given them a higher productive corn and they had nowhere to store it and was getting, as I said, eaten by weevils and rats. So the aid workers, instead of using some chemical, which they could have done, went and saw at the airport were 44 gallon drums, huge drums. And so they cleaned them out because they had, you know, petroleum in them. Uh, they cleaned them out and they became storage drums. And they have been the lifesaver because instead of being eaten by wheels and rats, the corn is now feeding the family for three months or six months instead of just one. So it's simple technology and it's advanced technology. You can't you can't overall run. And I suppose that's where, where it comes into Sam's thing about looking at the, and the big picture and the whole, the whole system, not just at a farm, but at a community and regional level, what impact this will have. There's no point in, in, in pumping out the, the best corn if there's no market to sell it. So Angela Ag asks a great question and Matt, uh, you mentioned you're studying for a PhD to get the skills you need to work again in agriculture and international development. So is that necessary really to have a PhD? Um, and also if she can ask the follow-up question as someone who's worked in the area in the past, any suggestions about a pathway back may look like? Yeah. So um, done that work in the past, a pathway back. After hearing those stories, it sounds like I'm just following Anika. <laughs> but I, I never wanted to do a PhD. Um, sort of got encouraged to do honours at uni. I'd never really wanted to do that. And I thought, ah, all right, I'll do it. Um, just so then that door's open in the future. If in 10 years I want to 
come back and do a PhD, but I don't like research. Why would I do that? Um, but I just love working in international ag and met so many people overseas and had so many um, conversations and, and sort of realized that whilst I felt like I had this, the uh, many skills um, to be able to make a difference working in that, um, in the, for, whether for the UN or, or FAO or in different NGOs, non-government organisations and stuff, that they're, they're looking for, um, for postgraduate studies. So often you do need a master's or a PhD just to get your foot in the door. Um, so I wanted to shy away and I'll, I'll find a job, I'll get one, but um, kept applying it and they're, they're all there and so many other countries um, have 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 at least master's degrees. Um, lots of Americans have master's degrees, so they're they're straight away in to get the interview. Whereas if you don't have it, you you're often locked out. No doubt there are um, pathways, but also um, I notice, and I'm not sure if the others notice. Uh, certainly, the older you are, the more respect you gain um, working in international ag from the farmers. But also you can leapfrog some of that if you've got if you're a doctor um without that you really um it is challenging if you're a doctor in something else to the to the field you're working in it doesn't really matter you're a doctor um and and you get that you can get that respect um i don't know what's everyone else think anika do you want to go to that because you were both a volunteer and also yeah or, yeah then yeah PhD. thanks and i recently was conferred so i now am a doctor but I would like to say that, you know, I think we all carve out our own path. Um, and, you know, I, I do strongly believe that you gain your education in so many places. It's not just the classroom. It's not just a university. You learn by sitting down with farmers, by, you know, talking with extension officers, by traveling overseas. And that education in all those varied forms helps you to carve out your path. Um, I do think it's helpful to reflect on, you know, what you have currently and where you want to go, like what area do you want to work in? Life is a bit like Google Maps, like if you can do an audit of your skills and knowledge that you have now and work out, you know, what you want to achieve, then you can actually, you know, having that start and end point, you can get there much more efficiently. So I don't believe you have to have a PhD, but if it's going to help you get to where you want to ultimately end up, then yeah, it might be worthwhile. Sam, what do you think? I'm sorry, uh, yeah. if you're doing a PhD, have you done? Uh, I'm starting one at the end of this year, but I was weighing up whether or not to do one. And I think, yeah, it, as Matt and Anika said, it can really help you, but you don't have to, to work in agriculture internationally. The bottom line is you have to have some sort of skill to be able to add value mm -hmm. in a, a different setting to your own. Um, and so one way of developing that skill is doing a PhD it could be, I've got other friends, one guy, he specializes in making videos to help farmers tell their own stories. So he doesn't have a PhD, he's just developed that experience of creating videos with rural people. And then another friend who, um, he's, he's a business person and he's just developed a lot of skills and a lot of business acumen over a long period of time in business. Um, and then he applies that in agriculture for international development. So the bottom line is you need to have a skill to add value and a PhD is one way of doing it, but um, it's not the only way. Well, we do have to draw this to a close, but I found this a really fascinating seminar. So thank you all to our speakers, to Anika, to Matt and Sam. And I think you'd have to agree with me, audience, that um, that was really inspiring and you can start small, but then, you know, you could be inspired to go on to do a PhD, even though you didn't know you were going to do it. Thank you to the speakers, Sam, Matt, and Anika and best of luck with your studies and with the work you're doing overseas. You know, be curious, be inquisitive, make agricultural science. Yeah, it's, it's such an, a meaningful area as Anika said. Um, and as Sam said, agricultural development is the most significant impact you can make on poverty. So very, very crucial bits to take away. And so thank you to Crawford Fund, to RAID and to ACR. And this initiative has been supported by Inspiring Australia as part of National Science Week.